हेलो गाइस हाउ आर यू आई एम हरदीप सिंह वेलकम बैक टू योर ओन यूट्यूब चैनल आल्स अपडेट्स एंड रीसेंट एग्जाम्स फॉर मोर अपडेट्स रिलेटेड टू रीसेंट आल्स एग्जाम राइटिंग दस टॉपिक्स लिस्टनिंग रीडिंग प्रैक्टिस टेस्ट एंड स्पीकिंग क्यू कैट गेस वर्क प्लीज गाइस पार्टिसिपेट इन एवरी डे लिस्टनिंग एंड रीडिंग प्रैक्टिस टेस्ट टू अचीव योर डिजायर बैंड स्कोर इन योर एक्चुअल आल्स एग्जाम Please hit the like and subscribe button. Press the bell icon for the upcoming notifications. Don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page Alts updates and recent exams. Part 1. First, you have some time to look at questions. Okay, so it's Millie's turn to give her tutorial today, isn't it? That's right. I'm going to talk about renewable energy sources and specifically solar towers. I'm not sure how much you already know about solar towers, so I thought I'd start with a few questions. First of all, does anyone know how solar towers work? Don't they somehow use the sun's energy to create electricity? Yes, in a way. They actually work by using the sun to make columns of hot air that rise upwards through the center of the tower. Now, do you know how old this idea is? Mm, I would have thought it was a 20th century idea. That's when we've had to start thinking about how to solve energy problems, isn't it? No, I read something about this last week. The first time solar energy was produced was in the 17th century, wasn't it? That's right. So it's not a modern idea at all. And Leonardo da Vinci also made sketches of a solar tower, though he never actually built one. Their recent history starts really with a man called Jörg Schlake. Yes, I read about him. He's a professor from Germany, and he needed a country with plenty of sunshine and land for his research, so he chose Spain to build the first tower. Correct. Well, Everyone seems to know something about these towers. Yes, but I still don't really understand how they work. Well, I've made a flowchart to help you. Firstly, you have to realize that they are very tall towers. They're constructed out of high-strength concrete, and they can be as high as 1000 feet. There's one being built in Australia that's 1 kilometer high. Now, All around the base of the tower, they have a sunlight collector, which is basically a large sheet of plastic. It extends out for as much as 7 kilometers, and it is raised off the ground slightly so it heats up the air underneath it. So, it acts like a greenhouse then. That's exactly right. In fact, they plan to try and grow plants underneath it as well. So, what happens to the air? Well, the sunlight collector heats it to 65 degrees centigrade. That's on average 35 degrees greater than the outside temperature. And the laws of physics mean that this hot air rises up the chimney or the tower and drives the turbines at the top. As the turbines revolve, they generate electricity. In fact, they can generate 200 megawatts of power or enough for 200,000 houses. Wow, that sounds impressive. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions. It can't all be good news. What are the disadvantages? I'll bet they're really expensive to operate. Well, no, not necessarily, because sunlight is free after all, 
so it's really only the initial outlay that is costly. After that, they're very efficient. But what about at night, when there is no sun? Well, they've managed to find a way to store the electricity produced during the day, so it's no problem at night, or even on cloudy days. So there are no drawbacks, then? Ah, I didn't say that. One problem they do have is that a lot of the energy in the sunlight is lost from the collector in the form of heat, and then, of the remaining heat, a large proportion escapes from the top of the tower. But they are still worth the investment because, as I said, sunlight is free. Hang on. If these towers are so tall, how do they cope in high winds? Surely they become dangerous then? Yes. Keeping them stable is another drawback. I believe they anchor the towers to the ground with wires to stabilize them so they're not dangerous. But it is an issue. You have certainly found an interesting topic today, so thanks, Millie. Perhaps we can have a look at your pictures now. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You will hear a guide giving instructions to a group of international students in Canada preparing for a whale watching trip. Before you hear the talk, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Hello, everyone. Glad to see so many happy faces on this wild and windy day. Are you all ready to go looking for whales? I'm Tony, and our other guide today is Dale. We'll be using these two rubber boats you see here, and our trip today will take three hours. In a few minutes, we'll be heading into part of the largest temperate rainforest of the Pacific Northwest. I'll show you our route on the map here. This is where we are now. We'll be leaving the sheltered bay and heading out across the mouth of the bay toward the open water. As you know, last night there were strong winds in the area, so we can't go out into the ocean as we had planned. Near the mouth, the water will be quite rough. That's where we are most likely to spot orcas, or killer whales as they are also called. After crossing the mouth of the bay, we'll enter the calmer, shallower waters. This is where you look for gray whales. Then we will continue up this narrow inlet close to the shore. You will have a great view of giant fir and cedar trees that have never been logged. Here is the place to watch for wildlife. You are likely to see bears along the shore and eagles in the sky overhead. Right at the back of the inlet here are the hot springs where we will be stopping for an hour. You can have a soothing soak in bubbling hot water before the return trip. I'll tell you a little bit about the whales now because with the noise of the wind and the engine you won't be able to hear much out there. As we head out in the boat we will probably see dolphins first. They are a gray color and quite small one to two meters long. They will swim right beside the boat, racing along and sometimes jumping out of the water just ahead of us. They swim very fast, and they are playful and curious. They're really fun to watch. The next ones we'll see are orcas, or killer whales, which are actually members of the dolphin family. They are seven to eight meters long, very fast, 
and they have sharp teeth. Some stay in these waters all year round. We identify them by the distinctive black and white color. They feed mainly on salmon in these waters, but the orchid diet can include seabirds, seals, dolphins, and other mammals. They can be fierce hunters, and this is why they are called killer whales. We should start watching for them as soon as we get out toward open water. We're likely to spot the orcas from a considerable distance. Watch for the black and white marking and mist spouting from the blowholes on top of their heads. Just outside the inlet is where we will probably see gray whales. The grays are migratory. They pass through here twice a year, moving from far in the north where they feed to the warm southern waters where they breed. You are very lucky today because several have been reported in the area. Unlike the orcas, greys are solitary, except when you see a mother with a calf. The grey whales are much longer and heavier than the orcas, 14 meters long and weighing up to 30 tons. The grey whales are filter feeders, gathering tiny ghost shrimp from the sand at the bottom. We recognize greys from their tail fins because each one is different. Once we find the whales, we'll come up as close as we can safely. We are allowed to approach the whales no closer than 50 meters, but that feels pretty close when you are in the presence of animals this big. You'll see mist coming out of the blowholes when they breathe out, and you'll hear a loud hiss. If we are downwind, we might even be able to smell them, a strong, fishy smell. Before the talk continues, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now, for just a few words of caution. It will be quite bouncy out there, especially in the front of the boat. If you want a smoother ride, stay in the middle of the boat, close to the engine. Hold on to the ropes and keep an eye on any big waves. Be alert so you don't get thrown out of the boat. In case of an emergency, you are all wearing survival suits. They'll keep you warm and dry in or out of the water. They are bright orange for visibility. The water temperature is around 8 degrees. Without these suits, you would only last a few minutes in this cold water. With these suits, your survival time is increased dramatically. They will keep you upright in the water even if you can't swim. But we don't expect anybody to end up in the water, so don't worry. Now, are there any questions? I'm afraid of getting seasick. Right. I was just coming to that. If you think you might get seasick, take one of these patches and put it on your arm at the wrist. Like this. It works on pressure points of the body and will relieve seasickness without the drowsiness you can get from pills. Are there any other questions? All right, then. Let's start loading up the boats. We leave in five minutes. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You will hear a conversation between four students, Lynn, 
Thomas, Sophie and David. They are talking about one of their tutors, Marlena. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Thomas, let's not go to the lab. Let's just stay here in the student lounge and drink tea and review the chapter. You know we can't do that. We've a responsibility to turn up and make sure our tutor has understood the week's lectures. If we don't go, no one will ever even realise she's got the theories all muddled up. Oh, really? Sophie, it's awful. Marlena just opens her mouth and I'm confused. Really, she... Marlena's our tutor. Yeah, I gathered that. You lot have got no manners. I was in the middle of saying something. <sighs> She'll say things that make no sense whatsoever. And I'm thinking I've misunderstood something. And I'm looking around the room and everyone has these looks on their faces of... Disbelief and merriment. <laughs> <sighs> Maybe you do, Thomas, but we're not all geniuses. Really, I'll be so worried that I've got it all wrong. Then people start asking questions and, by and by, we figure out that she's mixed something up. That's too bad. It's not a good situation at all. But surely you're exaggerating a bit, Lynn. No, it's awful. I don't know how she got through her undergraduate studies, much less got accepted as a postgrad here. You'd think our professor would have some idea about her abilities. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Marlena's an unusual name. Is she English? She's Spanish, David. She's got a really strong accent. Really, that's a lot of the problem, I think. I don't think she's thick. She just doesn't communicate very well. I'm not sure she understands us completely, especially when someone's joking around. <laughs> and we do tease her a bit, I must admit. What a nightmare. I'd hate to have you in my class if I was a tutor, Tom. As long as you're clever, Sophie, you'd have nothing to worry about. But you've just said she's not thick. I think I've met her, actually. I think we had a class together maybe last year. She was really shy and quiet, hardly spoke the whole term. But she, she was always smiley and friendly. She seemed nice, actually, and I think she got one of the highest marks in the class. Maybe you've all picked on her so much that she's so nervous that she can't think clearly. Ever think of that? But we don't need to babysit. We need help. It's a difficult subject. Has anyone ever gone up and asked her for help individually? Yes, actually, I have. I couldn't understand one of the formulas in the first chapter. The theory about why it worked just made no sense to me. So I went and asked her about it, and she cleared it right up. She was very helpful. She's not thick. I already said that. She's just so much fun to torment, right? Yep, that's it. Lynn, if you're having trouble with something, why don't you make an appointment to meet with her individually and see if she can help you that way? Maybe you'd see a different side of her. I reckon she just hates getting up in front of the class, and I can hardly blame her. <sighs> yes, I could try that, I suppose. Guys, the, the tutors aren't old academics who've been teaching for 30 years. They're just like us, two years down the road if we're clever enough to continue with our education. I know I'd be mortified to get up in front of you lot, and I don't think I'll feel that differently in a couple of years' time. You know, we're far more experienced as students than they are as teachers. Hmm, you're right, David. Really, it's more like one of our mates is trying to help us out. But, you know... 
Our mates aren't so frightened of us. Yeah, but you aren't so horrible to your mates, are you? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. You will hear a talk on research in the Indian Ocean. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. In this, the first lecture in our series on the changing face of the oceans of the world, we are going to look at the Indian Ocean, into which the Oceanography Department at the Institute here in Australia has been doing pioneering research over the past five years. Let us start with some facts about the Indian Ocean to give you an idea of the scope and complexity of the enterprise we have undertaken. As you can see from the diagrams here on the screen, showing the relative size of the planet's five oceans, the Indian Ocean comes third after the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, but is larger than the Southern Ocean and the Arctic Ocean. On this slide, you can see that the Indian Ocean is different from the two larger oceans in that it is landlocked to the north and does not extend into the cold regions of the North Pole. Covering some 73,440,000 square kilometres, the ocean constitutes approximately one-seventh of the Earth's surface and about 20% of the world's total ocean area. At the equator, it is around 6,400 kilometres wide, with the average depth being about 3,400 metres, and with the deepest point being the Java Trench at 7,450 metres. Flowing into the Indian Ocean, we have some of the world's greatest rivers. The Zambezi here, the Ganges here, the Indus, the Brahmaputra and the Tigris-Euphrates just here. The two largest islands in the Indian Ocean, Madagascar, here off the coast of Africa, and Sri Lanka, here off the southern tip of India, are structurally parts of the continents of Africa and Asia, while islands like the Seychelles are exposed tops of submerged ridges. The Maldives are low coral islands, and Mauritius and Réunion are volcanic cones. The surface waters of the ocean are warm, except where the ocean touches the cold waters to the south. A network of scientists, mainly oceanographers and meteorologists from around the world, are monitoring changes in the ocean's temperature and acidity, especially where it meets the southern ocean, in order to see how global warming is having an effect on the waters there. An assessment is also being carried out on how this is impacting on low-lying habitats and peoples in the more populated coastal regions around the rim of the ocean. In the warmer north, islands are vulnerable to even the subtlest changes in sea levels and tides, so they are being closely watched. Moreover, a close eye is being kept on wind changes, especially alterations to the monsoon rains, typhoons, cyclones and any other natural phenomena.
In addition to the information sent from the ship that we have stationed off Antarctica, in the south of the Indian Ocean, data are being transmitted round the clock from buoys anchored at various points around the ocean. Five of these buoys are observing ice packs and icebergs coming into the Indian Ocean from Antarctica. Besides the buoys, data on cloud cover and wind and temperature change are received by satellite. Satellite images are also being used to record the size of the icebergs from the moment they break off from Antarctica. Their course is then mapped as they move out into the Southern Ocean. Here at the Institute, the raw data from the various sources are received and the information is then constantly processed by a bank of computers. Once the data have been collated, the next step in the process is the analysis by experts here and at centres around the world looking for even the slightest shift in patterns of temperature, wind and sea levels. In the light of the fact that this is a global enterprise, the Institute is staffed 24 hours a day with researchers working in shifts, and we are in constant contact with centres all around the world. In total, 900 experts from around the globe are involved in the programme. The work at the Institute is now into the fifth year of a 10-year data collection which began in 2003. The analysis of the five years to 2008 will be published early in 2009. However, changes in patterns are already being noticed since the data have been gathered. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. So guys, don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page. I'll update some recent exams for more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing as topics, listening, reading, practice test and speaking QCAT guesswork. Please guys participate in everyday new IELTS listening and reading practice tests to achieve your desired band score in your actual IELTS exam. For more IELTS material, visit my official website www.ielsupdatesandrecentexams.com The link is given below in the description. If you need PDF files of latest IELTS material, then please join my Telegram channel. So guys, please write your score below the comment section. Again, thanks for listening. God bless you all guys. Stay tuned. Stay safe.